Hi, this is your host of Libhartia and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us once again, Neeraj Tholia, CEO and co-founder of Elsian. Neeraj, it's great to have you on the show. Sapna Let us so great to be back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, we used to talk, you know, when you podcast and, and then it was, you know, acquired uh, by VM. Uh, and if I'm not wrong, VM is investing 21 million Series A in Eltian. So uh, there is so much to talk about, but I want to start with the basic, which is that after VM, after, you know, Kasten, of course, you took a break and then you led to this new company. Talk a bit about what was still the pain point. There are so many, to be honest with you, in this space that you wanted to address that led to the creation of LCN. And also, what is the story behind the name? Great question. So let's start with the story behind the name, right? So just, you know, we've spoken earlier, but for your listeners that might not be aware, I am very passionate about data protection, worked on that in graduate school. And then ever since at multiple companies, that's what I've been working on. I think it's a big issue for our customers in the enterprise, and that's why we started Alcyon again. I'll talk about why exactly in a second, but from the name, I think the name is quite apropos because it is comes from Greek mythology, and Alcyon is supposed to be the seven days within winter where no storms happen. It's like a safe harbor in a period of adversity and a, a, a time of peace and calm. So given what we do, it was a great name. Now the Greek domain name was taken. So we went for the Spanish version of it and that's why it's Alcyon. And in particular, Alcyon.ai, which is actually a great segue to your next question, which was why start another company? No, it wasn't in the books at all. But right at Veeam, when we started talking to people, backup, disaster recovery, always a requirement. But what people started getting more concerned about, as you've spoken about on some of your other episodes, is the threats that we see from attackers out there when we talk about ransomware, malware, people getting impacted. And what we quickly discovered doing bolt-on solutions to existing products would not be feasible. So really, that's why, and we started before the chat GPT craze took off, but we knew AI was going to be the only fundamental way that we would solve these data protection challenges where it ranged from backup and disaster recovery all the way to security in the form of ransomware, malware, XDR integration, broader security ecosystem. You could only do it with a green slate, a clean slate rather. First of all, as you rightly said, this is kind of a problem like security that is always going to be there. This is not, hey, we saw this problem, let's move to the next phase. Number two is that it's also kind of a sticky market. Once you move to a player, you stick to that. Uh, so uh, talk a bit about with this LCN, are you at this point targeting a specific market? Of course, uh, you came up with Microsoft 365 support. It's a market and also how you're applying to deal with the stickiness of this space. So it's uh, another, right, love your questions, but uh, another great question. So the way I look at it is, right, for Microsoft, as you said, right, we are looking at data protection to start with, with Microsoft 365. The reason why we like it, which addresses some of your stickiness part, it's a growing market. It is slightly underserved, not enough people have backup but people are becoming more aware for the need for backup. I think Microsoft released data that hundreds of petabytes of data added every month to SharePoint. This is business critical data that people have. And so how do you protect that as raised, the priority has gone up as people have moved more to on from on-prem, right? Which COVID accelerated to a cloud model where you have data and SaaS services, where you had SharePoint exchange on-prem, all of them in the cloud. Different API surface, different attack vectors, different concerns, but everyone's using it more. So I think that was a great intersection point for us to go start this business in the space because there's this need, there's an opportunity, and we could do something new. And is the scope of LCN going to kind of limit it to, uh, you know, Office 365 like offering or um, of course? We are going to grow. We, we started Microsoft 365, our immediate focus for a while. And we came out of stealth a few months ago. As you know, we announced our $21 million raise for Series A a couple of months ago. And what we've really seen is customer feedback. We have a wide diversity of customers, everything from construction firms, IT, finance, 
private bodyguard companies, everyone needs their data protected. Uh, sports boards, um, right? One of the world's cricket boards is our customer. So we, we are seeing a wide diversity in our customer base here. And we are, and they are telling us where to go next to answer your question, because we've protected 365 and now they're saying, look, we love what you do for solving these SaaS services and the way other vendors are not being able to. Can you also do this for X and Y for me? So we have, you know, don't want to commit to something on the show, but we are actively exploring how we're going to expand. And for us, it's always been customer driven. Can you just give a quick overview of your core products or services? What do they look like? Our tagline is AI driven data protection for Microsoft 365. So today, if you have data in Exchange, it will be surprised how many small businesses still run on email, even though they have OneDrive and SharePoint. So how do you protect critical data in Exchange in OneDrive and SharePoint, which are the document libraries for the people in this ecosystem? And then more recently, even Teams, because Microsoft Teams, I mean, sometimes in Silicon Valley, everyone's using Slack as an example. But when you look at the install base, there's just so much business happening in, across Microsoft Teams. Protecting the data there becomes important too. So for across these portfolio of products uh, that Microsoft provides, how do we back up the data for backup disaster recovery? But the main use case tends to be security related, where how do you detect ransomware happening? And how do you do that using AI? How do you do malware detection? Uh, how do you detect anomalous behavior? apart from your accidents and uh, things of that sort. We also predict against, you know, for people that have compliance requirements and then people that also have um, right, threats about malicious insiders. Some companies see a lot of churn. So how do you protect against that? So that's where customers are coming to us from. But in a nutshell, it's very simple. We use AI and we never mix customers' data or customers' model, but we use AI to protect our customers' data. When we talk about AI, we have been leveraging and using AI for a very long time. Uh, it's only the generative AI, chat GPT, they kind of uh, rekindled interest in AI. Talk a bit about what uh, what are your thoughts on generative AI? Will you also be offering services to... So let's look at a data protection or disaster or data recovery for generative AI at the same as generative AI for LCN. So right now, most of the users in that sense in turn, our goal is that we not be focused on security, we focus on AI, and then we focus on ease of use and how these three intersect with each other. So our goal is to use this extensively internally so that customers aren't overloaded by some of this work that we do. So there's a lot of complexity. We have a great blog on how we do ransomware detection using AI, multiple models on a per user basis, which and a per file basis, which I believe none of our competitors are doing. So I you know, recommend people check that out on a company blog. But really, when I look at the use of AI today for us, it is internal that we expose to customers a security incidents. Hmm? Now, to go back to your other question, wait, how do you protect some of these other emerging category of applications? It is something we're definitely keeping an eye on. Hmm? and how you protect some of the models, the source data, et cetera, especially when you're using third-party services, if you're using OpenAI's infrastructure, as an example. So some of that will come up, but not an immediate focus right now. I think that market is just a little nascent, that the ecosystem still needs to shake out a little bit more before you can focus on it. When we look at LCN, of course, there are a lot of incumbents which were born in the cloud, cloud native era. Then there are a lot of vendors which we call traditional or Lex vendor. How do you set yourself apart from these two different breeds? So I think the way we look at ourselves is the big thing, and I will talk, use my customer's words to tell you about this. It is ease of use. Right? So as a technologist, I'm very proud of what we built. Right? We have an entirely serverless system that scales down to zero for a you know, multiple petabyte, hopefully in the near future, exabyte scale system, which is what we've designed for, we scale down to zero. So from a technical perspective, it's great. Customers, what they care about is, how easy do you make it to get my job done? Which in this case, protecting my data. How can I sleep better at night? And the constant thing that shows up is, look, you have all these amazing features. You don't overload us with security warnings. It makes it easy to get my job done. I save multiple hours, sometimes a week from using your system. And ease of use is the biggest thing customers have told us. And right, you can never, customers never wrong there. So there's all this great technology under the hood. 
presented in such an easy to consume manner, which has differentiated us definitely from the legacy vendors. And then from when we talk about born in the cloud companies, again, what we've done for what is a complex product is how we also go to market. So we are adopting what people call product-led growth. And a lot of our customers come up, there's a free trial, there's no hand-holding, there's no salesperson, we are there, the sales team is there if you need help. But really it's about how users can self-drive their experience, as we see with any modern software product which again is hard to find in the industry, and especially in the data protection industry today, which has tended to be complex, and therefore they want someone hand-holding you. And we've said, no, you shouldn't need that in a modern world. What kind of market opportunities are there? Of course, as we discussed earlier, of course, data backup is more or less like having a seat belt or airbag or brakes in the car. You know, it, it, it has, it's a very, very critical piece, so it's not even companies could think about it. But complications, busy market, a lot of players. And then let's also look at maybe you're also looking at some emerging use cases that you feel LCN can target better than others. I think you hit the analogy right there, Swapnil, when you talk about airbags, right? You think of airbags somewhat like insurance. You don't need it on a daily basis, but when you need it, you're really grateful to have them, right? So that is obviously we covered that, but I think we moved it to something of a more active thing. Let's think of it as a gas and brake that you use more often, that you're using on a constant basis in your car, right? Or moving forward, self-driven cars, the software engine that drives that self-driving. So what we've looked at is, and that's why we use the word protection, not backup. We use the word that is more, what we try to do is a lot more active. Again, compared to right, some of the competitors you talked about, going to the car analogy, if you look at a Tesla, it's constantly looking at how do you avoid other cars, how do you stay in your lane, um, how do you make sure the passengers are safe no matter what else is happening in the world around you. We think of it as something similar because some, for some customers, hundreds of times a day, we're checking the state of the system as to is there a security attack, did something change, can you pull data in from other third-party systems to build a better security posture for you. So it's not just about the airbags that are passive-based, sensor-based things, but we pull data in, say, for example, from other XDR systems. So if a company's, say, for example, their VM's under attack or the laptop's under attack, we will take more defensive actions because we can see around us what's changing. So we've switched from not just including that insurance side of the house, but moving over to the more active day-to-day usage of our system for our customers today. Data production is kind of moving in developers pipeline where they, they, instead of just having an insurance, they also use it for a lot of different active, you know, their CI CD pipeline. So can you talk about what role data production can or is playing there in that space to enable developers? So I think a couple of things, there's a lot of definite focus on the whole shift left, shift left part of it. Right? Um, and we see that happening today where how do you bring this early? Sometimes it's for data copies, for testing in, uh, testing outside of production, as an example. Sometimes it is about how do you ensure, especially with the growth of microservices and some of those applications, as they move from inception to production at every stage, the right best practices are built in. So suddenly you don't discover when you're deploying, this has happened in some outages recently, that, oops, I didn't build this out in a highly reliable manner. So right, there's obviously from the broader perspective that happens. In our ecosystem today, the world has shifted. So it's not the way traditional developers building microservices, but we see in the Microsoft ecosystem, the power apps, power automate developers, Microsoft is an extremely rich ecosystem that's low code, no code. So we are exploring that in some sense. We see these SharePoint admins that are again, responsible for multiple petabytes of data. And then how do they manage that in a secure way? Because the cost of getting, making changes is, is massive. So how do you help those and when they're adding apps to their ecosystem? So we're seeing some of that equivalent play out that you've seen in the cloud native ecosystem, right? Just coming off um, other conferences like KubeCon recently. We're seeing that show up in some of these other more traditional IT ecosystems because ShiftLift is powerful. Can you also talk about some of the use cases, is there any specific vertical that you're targeting or it really doesn't matter which whoever needs data production, 
you are there for them. You know, there is what you start off with. And we said, look, you know, we think because of a modern cloud first nature, we'd initially attract more traditional IT firms, startups, etc. But the short answer is no. Our customers, we are right now, we have global um, customers. So we are, we have data centers in Australia, in EU, in the US. And we make sure for regulatory reasons, data and metadata never leaves those regions. But we have not only customers that are global, but across vertical, as I mentioned earlier. So IT is a fraction of our business, but we see um, right, finance firms, accounting firms, um, and we have a bunch of great case studies on our website, uh, right, sports uh, organizations, construction. I'm just trying to right, rattle off electrical supply houses, the folks that supply breakers and panels, trucking companies. So the good thing is for even, and we have a wide diversity and also size of customers from small to very large. And we see this too, where even small companies now know the importance of protecting the data. Right? I mean, my, from personal experience, contractors we know have gotten fish and ransomware and it's business destructing for them. And so these smaller companies have woken up to the fact that the business depends on being online. And so how do they protect the data? So we are very happy to see this broad diversity of customers that have uh, selected us and decided to go with us. I want to talk about, uh, of course, the previous company, Cast10, that was acquired by VM. Now, VM is once again investing 21 million Series A in, in LCN. What does it mean for LCN? What does it mean for VM? What does it mean for Cast10? So Veeam's a big supporter uh, we, between us and now your viewers. Uh, taking money from a strategic at an early stage of the company is not something I would have traditionally thought about doing. But Veeam was an exception. There's obviously, I have a deep history with them. I really like the company and the leadership there. I've known them for many years right now. So big fans of that. There's some overlap in the market, but not as much as you would think because of just how we position being cloud first, we must traditionally be in a product first company, which is installed on prem. We say, how do we take this complexity away, focus on newer use cases, such as ransomware malware. So there's that. But at the end of the day, right, there is our path is still independent. Veeam is an investor. In our term sheets and our funding documents, if we took Veeam's name out and replaced it with someone else, it would look just the same. Mm -hmm. So from their perspective, it is also a financial investment here. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to be independent. We see a very, I am very optimistic about the future in front of us based on what the last few months have shown us. So I am super excited about building out a large company here. What kind of threats you're seeing in this space? Now we can talk about the whole traditional ransomware, mm -hmm. all those things, but either we can look at new kind of either threat you are looking at or because of the emergence of new workload, mm -hmm. new kind of, social engineering uh, where it's less about the threat but more about hey because of this use case this is and also if you can talk about which industries do you think are going to be more vulnerable two or three important things to talk about right when we go look at threats i think some of the attack surfaces change mm -hmm. where for example we just you know ran through this internally at a company traditionally ransomware would come they would attack your storage system they'd attack your filer your vms it's all on-prem with the growth of these SaaS services you don't even need to be within a company's network parameter there's an api surface you can access from externally and then you can ransomware the entire thing and so you your traditional things that might be looking at network flow of data or suddenly so much data started flowing through our systems aren't effective because it's no longer you don't see any edge traffic we also see both read and we focus on ransomware a lot, but there's just some, it's not a, it's an umbrella term is the way I look at it. Because it is, there's so many different kinds of attacks that are happening right now. Some that in, in only encrypt partial files to prevent detection. Some that are slow moving, some that are fast moving, some that replace files, some that don't. So we've deployed multiple models per user um, to go and that learn online user behavior, no other real way of doing it. You can deploy models once a month and figure that one out. So we've done a lot of those things um, to be able to capture these new emerging threats that people don't think about. But going to your second question about who is going to get impacted the most, unfortunately I have sad news in that sense where ransomware is indiscriminate. Hmm? We have seen them impacting small teams, 
for example, targeted attacks against finance teams. We've seen them attacking more traditional industries, um, electrical as an example, small regional stores. So we, it is unfortunately, they, it's a spray and pray approach for them. It's a volume game for them where they will try and ransomware as many folks as they potentially can and then see who can pay, who cannot. And with the growth of, if you've been read, if some of your readers have been you know, looking after this, is the growth of ransomware as a service. So it's just one of these things where it is truly indiscriminate. So I think anyone that is using online services today, which is pretty much everyone out there today in terms of companies and enterprises, need to be worrying about this. It's not like suddenly anymore finances or large firms are going to be the prime target. Indiscriminate attacks is what we see. Of course, you have solutions for them, but what advice you have for them? So these solutions can go only so far. They need to, we have talked about the importance of culture as well, or having a holistic approach towards, you know, data backup security, you know, or data protection. What advice do you have for them? So. Here's the other thing, talking about the inevitability of ransomware, right? recent surveys have shown that 80% of server respondents have been attacked by ransomware and the joke goes the other 20% might just not know it yet. Um, and it is, again, an unfortunate state of affairs, but it's a reality we live in. So the advice I give people is obviously, first of all, explore state of the art. We talked about stickiness earlier in our conversation, but sometimes the solution that you had five years ago is not the best protection solution for the next five years. So explore what the state of the art is. Have game days where you look at recovery, how recovery happens. So how, what's the preparation for this? Um, how do you protect um, your data? How do you tier and categorize data? Do you know where your most important data is? That is, what do you need to bring your business back online? How quickly can you do that? So have game days, have your playbooks, run through it. Sometimes it seems like an investment of time, but if you've done this well, recovery is going to be great because it's going to not just bring your business back faster, it's going to cost you less money. You won't have to pay ransomware attackers. Right? The number of features we also have built in to make this easier so we don't allow synchronous backup deletions. So if someone could compromise an admin, they can't go delete backups. Um, but And to be able to go through this checklist will really pay off for customers out there. Can you also talk about what is the importance of open source for LCN? Of course, it was quite important for Kasten, but let's talk about uh, LCN as well. You know, I find it very interesting that the data protection industry, unlike some other ecosystems, has very little open source in them in a meaningful way. There'll be scripts around a product or a dashboard with Grafana, but nothing core. And we've decided to change that up where we have a very active project called Corso. And a lot of what we provide as a service today the core of that is, you know, uh, you can find it at CorsoBackup.io. Backup for Microsoft 365, we release completely free and open source. It's under the Apache license today. And we don't see any, we don't have any plans of that changing. Active community, people are using us to back up very large systems. Uh, people are very helpful in the community. You can come find us on Discord there. And so our belief is, my fundamental belief is, look, sometimes there might be a price issue with paying a SaaS provider. You go take this for free. I mean, it will provide benefit, make sure you're protected. Once things, once budgets change, et cetera, come talk to us, but we'd rather have you be protected if you can't, if it doesn't fit in your budget this year. And so, and just to be clear, the open source course is what we use in our product. We layer security and a bunch of other things on top of that when we talk about ransomware malware. But the core backup restore functionality is free for our customers today, it uses object storage, so very efficient, very cheap to run. Of course, uh, companies relatively new, there are a lot of things that you folks are working on. A lot of things you cannot talk about, but just, just give us a teaser, a glimpse of what to expect from you folks. We will be doing in the next couple of months um, very, very interesting things. We a focus on security continues. But our focus is now, you know, now that our core foundation's in place. How do we focus on making our stores much faster? How do we have better tools to the admin to say, how do you recover quickly from widespread attacks? How do you do detection faster? So there's a lot of these things that are going to make the admin's life easier when they're under pressure. 
And so those are some of the things that we're working on that I think when it comes out is going to be you know, fairly interesting, somewhat unique in the market. Neeraj, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about LCN. And as I can clearly see, there are so many things in the pipeline. So I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Swapnil, to you and your listeners for hearing us out today. As always, it was exciting chatting with you. 